This year's theme for 2024 is titled Tech Transformation, Shaping the Future of Society, Education, and Industry. November to Remember is a, is a wonderful initiative started by Dr. Celestine Wendy. Um, it's done basically to increase the research culture at the University of Bolton by calling esteemed speakers to speak on various domains. And this is not just related to our career, it's also related to us as individuals because you see topics related to domains in computer science and you see topics relating to domains in professional practice. This week will be, not this week, today, we'll be talking about machine learning and we have the distinguished speaker, Dr. Vishnu Kendiala. And I would do a brief summary of his bio. Dr. Vishnu Pendiala is a faculty member in applied data science and an academic senator with San Jose State University, United States. He is, the current chair. he is the current chair of the IEEE Computer Society Santa Clara Valley Chapter and IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Contributor. During his three-year term as an ACM Distinguished Speaker and before that as a researcher and industry expert, he gave numerous 70-plus talks in various reputed forums such as faculty development programs, the 12th IEEE GHCC, the IEEE ANTS, the 12th IAWC, the 10th ICMC, IUCEE, to audiences at venues such as Stanford University, University of Bolton, and so forth. Some of these talks are available online on YouTube and on IEEE.tv. He is a senior member of the IEEE and has over two decades of experience in the software industry in the Silicon Valley, USA. His book, Veracity of Big Data, is available in several libraries, including those of MIT, Stanford, CMU, the US Congress, and internationally. Two other books on machine learning and software development that he edited are also well received and found place in the US Library of Congress and other reputed libraries. Dr. Pendiala taught a one-week course sponsored by the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India, under the GIAN program in 2017 to computer science faculty from all over the country and delivered a keynote in a similar program sponsored by AICTE, Government of India, in 2022. Dr. Pendiala recently served on the U.S. government's National Science Foundation NSF Proposal Review Panel. He received the Ramanujan Memorial Gold Medal and a shield for his college at the State Math Olympiad. He also played an active role in Computer Society of India and was the program secretary for his annual national convention. And more importantly, Dr. Pendiala was also, also spoke in the previous November to November talks. Welcome, Dr. Pendiala. Thank you, uh, Lair. Uh, that was a very generous introduction. Yeah. It's good to have you again. Yeah. yeah, it's a pleasure to be back with you all. Okay. So without further ado, um, you can begin your lecture, Dr. Pendiala. Yeah, sure. I will start sharing my screen. Everyone able to see my screen, right? Yes, thank yeah. you. Thanks for the contribution. Yeah. So, so, today's topic is explainability of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning models for a socially sustainable growth, artificial intelligence growth. 
Uh, we know AI ML is really booming and it will continue to drive the economy in the coming years and uh, is likely to be in control for uh, many years to come and of many domains and life critical tasks. So just like we want our governments, leaders and everyone in control to be transparent, we want the AI ML models also to be transparent. Social, adverse, uh, social uh, sustainability will be adversely impacted otherwise, and uh, there will be increasing resistance to the adoption of AIML. We already see quite a bit of uh, resistance um, from quite a few quarters, some cautions and some warnings and things like that. So there will be increasing resistance if, uh, and then it will be, uh, it will jeopardize our social sustainability if uh, the models are not explainable. So that is the top, uh, topic of today's uh, <clears throat> uh, session. So let's start with this uh, recent news uh, about uh, uh, the godfather of uh, artificial intelligence winning uh, the Nobel Prize. Um, so um, so the, in this, uh, New Yorker uh, um, article, uh, there's a profile of uh, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, the this year's Nobel Prize winner. He is afraid that uh, we may lose control over the artificial intelligence models that we are building. So the title of the article is Why the Godfather of Artificial Intelligence Fears What He Has Built. So it reminds me of one famous quotation. We fear what we don't understand. So this is uh, spoken by the character of Dr. Jonathan Crane. I, I believe in the movie is called Scarecrow in the Batman Begins movie. So indeed, uh, we can't uh, drive a car if we don't understand why it took a right turn or a left turn or a U-turn, right? So being able to explain and interpret the tools that we use is critical to their usage. So that is the reason for explainability of AI ML models. And more importantly, AI makes mistakes. So it's not foolproof. It's not entirely accurate in its behavior. So the lack of explainability is a cause of worry that it may go out of hand, right? But um, the mistakes that AI makes make it even more compelling to call for explainability. So first thing is it decides unfairly. The models are sometimes biased. It has been proven and it has uh, uh, the adverse effects of its, its bias have been in use uh, quite uh, widely. It overfits causing privacy concerns. In my last year's talk at November to remember, I covered this topic of overfitting and privacy concerns and things like that. You can watch the video if you, if you are interested. And it hallucinates, AI models hallucinate giving incorrect answers. So uh, this is a big problem. Most of you would have observed this with, uh, when using large language models like ChatGPT or uh, Copilot and uh, Gemini, for instance. Uh, they all hallucinate. Uh, things have become much, much better now, but a few years back, it was really worse. I mean, a couple of years back, it was really worse. And often, no one can accurately explain its behavior. So with all these issues, there is certainly a reason to worry, right? Particularly the last reason. So earlier this year, we published a paper on mental health prediction. I believe uh, University of Bolton uh, psychointelligence that started uh, uh, focus. I mean, uh, there is a focus of this institute on psychointelligence. So that uh, also focuses on uh, using artificial intelligence for mental health issues. So for this paper, what we did was we took a data set on which several researchers published papers 
claiming outstanding performance of models in predicting mental health. Of course, we also got outstanding results uh, when we used those models. But what we found when we started explaining the model's behavior was not intuitive at all, as we will see later. So that is the reason why in the paper, we concluded that uh, this work proves that merely achieving superlative evaluation metrics can be dangerously misleading and may infringe upon ethical horizons. A future direction is to investigate methods to quantify the effectiveness of machine learning models in terms of insights from their explainability. So not just me, but several other researchers also found similar issues with relying on performance metrics alone. So for instance, in this paper, explainable AI for Android malware detection towards understanding why the models perform so well in 2022, uh, sorry, 2022, um, the authors uh, claimed that our results indicate that machine learning models classify malware based malware based on temporal differences between malware and benign rather than the actual malicious behaviors. So the features they were focusing on were not at all relevant. So they're focusing on temporal differences. And then they also say that we discover the temporal sample inconsistency in the training data set brings over optimistic classification performance up to 99% F1 score and accuracy. So they also found that accuracy is not a good measure and we need to understand how these models arrived at the predictions and at that superlative accuracy. Here's another. So in this paper, um, to what extent do a deep neural network based uh, image classification models make unreliable inferences um, published in a journal called Empirical Software Engineering. Uh, the authors say that uh, we applied our approach to 18 pre-trained single label image classification models and three multi-label classification models and then examined their inferences on the ImageNet and COCO dataset. We found that unreliable inferences are pervasive. Specifically for each model, more than thousands of correct classifications are actually made using irrelevant features. So hope that convinced you about the need for explainability and the, and the fact that uh, um, uh, um, accuracy alone is not sufficient. The evaluation metrics are not sufficient. There are many others like this, so much so that the European Union law back in May 2018 itself mandated explainability. So, so there is a there is a implicit right to explanation in the GDPR. GDPR stands for General Data Production Regulation, right? It's one of the most, uh, I think it's one of the finest legislation in the world of data, I think, in my opinion, at least. So in this GDPR, Recital 71, uh, it says uh, the a phrase or a part of the sentence uh, states that uh, to obtain an explanation of the decision reached after such assessment and to challenge the decision. So, um, so this is this is in a recital, and uh, the authority of the recital is non-binding under uh, European Union law, <clears throat> but it still provides a critical reference point for future interpretations. So, if uh, the court goes to the Supreme Court, then the judges can get to interpret. Uh, even in the lower courts, it is subject to interpretation. Uh, moreover, articles 13, 14, and 15 of the GDPR clearly state that of automated decision-making, including profiling, referred to in article 22, 1, and 4, and at least in those cases, meaningful information about the logic involved. So this again is implicit requirement for uh, uh, the right to explanation. 
<clears throat> so that's when, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> That's when uh, the model explainability comes into picture. So how do we explain the behavior of a machine learning model? <clears throat> so let us first consider a typical example and see how people and then machines explain their decisions. <clears throat> so let us take the example of uh, uh, credit applications. So somebody's credit has been denied. So there's a common application in the industry and academia. I used to give this as a homework assignment to my undergrad students who studied machine learning. Um, but there's a very big problem. People can commit suicides if their credit applications are denied in a critical situation. We have read in news, particularly in certain countries that people have actually, um, uh, <clears throat> so typically I, I read in the news that farmers in India committed suicide because of their financial situation and uh, inability to get credit. So this is a serious problem. So if the problem escalates to the court, banks need to give an explanation. And uh, so let us look at some of those explanations that people can give. So they can say that uh, the applicant uh, had a poor credit score. Uh, he or she had a history of late payments and defaults. So that's why the credit was denied. Or insufficient income, applicants' income is too low relative to their existing debt and uh, living expenses. <clears throat> or they could say that there are too many open credit accounts. Applicant had multiple credit cards and loans. So ability to manage additional credit is questionable. So that is the reason why the credit was denied. And more, there could be many such reasons. <clears throat> so, for instance, if they say that it is because the applicant is too old or is of this gender, this religion, or this ethnicity, this skin color, then the decision can be challenged in a court of law for bias and discrimination. Right? So that is the, that is the um, intent probably behind the GDPR, right? Uh, we want to be able to detect or understand how the machine learning model came to that decision and uh, then be able to challenge it. <clears throat> so uh, let us see how uh, machine learning does this. Uh, so what are, uh, first let us, uh, uh, let us see what the target variable is. What is the target variable? So the target variable is whether the credit application is approved or not. So that is the last column in the data set. The data set is like a table and the last column of the table is whether the credit application has been approved or not. And what are the features based on which the machine learning, application, uh, machine learning model adjudicates the application? So the, the, uh, the features are quite similar to what uh, the human beings used. Um, so the, the features could be gender, age, debt, marital status, bank customer. So these are all uh, the fields that an applicant fills in the application form. So whether the person is a bank customer, uh, their education level, ethnicity, the number of years the person has been employed, prior default, uh, employed, uh, credit score, late payment, citizen, zip code, uh, income, and so on and so forth. So these are all basically uh, fields in the application form. So like uh, we saw earlier, uh, <clears throat> uh, the machine learning model could, de uh, could reject the application based on late payments. It could reject based on credit score, it could uh, reject based on prior defaults, uh, based on income, based on debt, so on and so forth. So uh, the machine learning model does something very similar to what human beings do. They look at the features and then uh, make, the, make a decision as to the application. So one of the simplest uh, machine learning models is a logistic regression model. So what we do in logistic regression is uh, we have a bunch of uh, features like uh, 
x1, x2, x3, these correspond to the real world features like credit score. X1 corresponds to credit score, x2 to income, x3 through prior, prior default. All these have to be converted into numbers. And these numbers are <clears throat> passed to a summation module. Uh, <clears throat> so each of these features is given a relative importance, right? So uh, there is uh, the X1 feature credit score gets a weightage of W1. Uh, <clears throat> the prior default feature X3 gets a weightage of W3, so on and so forth. Uh, so the model determines these weights. And uh, <clears throat> uh, these weights are combined with the features as a weighted sum of the features. Uh, of course, uh, models also have a bias. So that bias is captured by an initial weight called W0. Uh, the, the one that corresponds to W0 is the bias. Uh, uh, bias stems from assumptions, just like the human bias stems from assumptions that certain gender is or certain religion, certain ethnicity, certain skin color is uh, superior to others. Um, Machine learning models also make some assumptions, but these assumptions are mathematical assumptions. Um, so because of the assumptions, the assumption, uh, the, there's a bias in the system, which is captured by W0. So all these weighted uh, features are uh, summed up and uh, the bias is also factored into the sum. And then to convert that sum into a probability, we pass it through a sigmoid function. Uh, sigmoid function is any function that looks like uh, that is in the shape of S, right? Here you can see the shape of S. So the uh, the in math it can be represented as uh, e power z by one plus e power z. This the this this particular sigmoid function is called the logistic function. There are many sigmoid functions which is are which are of the shape S, but this particular function that we are using here is called the logistic function. So we pass it pass the sum through this logistic function and we get a probability. So as you can see, <clears throat> what we generated uh, is similar <clears throat> to what the human beings did. The explanations are based on the features uh, <clears throat> and their weights, their relative importances. So that is how uh, uh, that is the general philosophy of machine learning models. In most cases, machine learning is essentially finding out the weights for each of these features. It learns, uh, the algorithm tries to learn the weights for these features. Uh, so the logistic regression module can be thought of as one unit of a neural network, one neuron. Of course, this, uh, this function, the sigmoid function could change to a different function or a, another sigmoid function, but that's a matter of detail. But the philosophy is that this kind of uh, functionality that we saw on this slide uh, captures one neuron. The first version of ChatGPT had 175 billion such, uh, such lines, these lines connecting the neurons. There were 175 billion such lines and each one of them having a weight. So you can understand uh, the difficulty now, right? It's very hard to explain when there are 175 billion such weights. If it is just uh, one weight corresponding to feature, it is somewhat explainable, not entirely, but at least somewhat explainable. Uh, for um, uh, if there are 175 billion weights, so that's where the challenge is. Another simple model is uh, uh, linear classification. So logistic regression is a smoother and better version of linear classification. So in linear classification too, uh, we combine the features with their weights. So the weights are basically the coefficients, which are the slopes along the dimensions. Um, uh, so uh, these uh, coefficients correspond to the um, hyperplane that separates the approved and the denied applications. So in machine learning, we all become vectors in space with magnitude and direction. So the vectors, there are two interpretations of a vector. Uh, one is uh, that uh, of a matrix with a single dimensional matrix with a bunch of numbers as elements. 
So that is one interpretation. And the other interpretation is the same vector can be represented as a point in space, vector space. So the numbers in the single dimensional matrix correspond to the dimensions in this vector space. So the applicants, the credit applicants, uh, all become vectors in the space. <clears throat> Uh, so the features are basically the values across the axis. So the Ws in this equation for the hyperplane indicate the importance of the features. So just like in logistic regression. Um, so there is another algorithm. This also is a simple algorithm called K nearest neighbors for credit. Uh, and we can use it for credit approval as well. So for instance, uh, we want to know whether John's application, this red star here with a question mark, he's John. We want to know whether John's situation, uh, whether John's application has to be approved or not. So he, we see that uh, John's situation is uh, similar to Tom, Dick, and Harry's. Uh, Tom is the green square and uh, Harry and Dick are uh, the blue um, polygons. Uh, probably hexagons, uh, right? <clears throat> so Tom's was approved. So the green box was approved, but Dixon Harris was denied. So that's the reason why they, they have a different shape and different color. So what is your guess? Should we approve John's uh, application or not? Probably not, right? Because the majority of the uh, neighbors have been uh, denied the credit application. So therefore, uh, the model is going to deny John's application. So typically, K is odd. So in this case, you see that K is three neighbors, right? Uh, <clears throat> so label varies with different Ks. Uh, the number K uh, will, uh, typically it is odd. Uh, so that is how uh, the K nearest neighbor algorithm works. And uh, it is quite explainable. We are able to explain based on the uh, proximity to the neighbors, uh, the neighbors and the, uh, the labels on the neighbors. There is another algorithm called decision tree. So in decision tree, what we do is we take uh, <clears throat> this kind of a training data set on the left uh, with uh, uh, which is a which is a kind of table. The last column is the target variable, whether credit credit is approved or not. And then uh, <clears throat> using some math uh, from information theory, we are going to construct uh, this kind of a decision tree. So whether the person has a prior default, uh, if no, then look at the location then if the location is uh, outsider or uh, county, then look at the income. If it is less, less than, uh, the income is less than 80K, then deny the application. So this is, uh, <clears throat> this is how a decision tree is constructed to, uh, to, uh, to basically adjudicate on the applications, the credit applications. So this, as you can see, this also is quite explainable. We are able to clearly say why a person's application has been denied or approved, right? So these leaves tell whether the application is approved or denied. So all these contribute, the algorithms that we talked about, the K nearest neighbors, decision trees, logistic regression, linear regression, these contribute towards what are called as ante hoc explainability. So these models are interpretable by design. But there is a need for post hoc explainability models also. That means post means some and means before happening and post means after happening, right? Uh, so, uh, so what if the model is a black box? For instance, you take uh, large language models like chat GPT where there are 175 billion such lines connecting the neurons. Uh, there are several other models which are complete black boxes. It is very hard to interpret what they are doing. So that is the challenge, the post hoc explainability methods address. 
So any idea what we can do? Um, so the question is, uh, can we create a model agnostic method for explaining predictions of machine learning models? So we want a method which does not depend on whether we are using decision trees, logistic regression, and things like that. So explanations are not specific to the machine learning models. Sometimes nearest neighbors or decision trees are not the best way to explain, right? So, um, and then um, <clears throat> the advantage of model agnostic methods is that we can easily replace or upgrade models without changing the explanation approach. And explainability becomes now becomes a layer on top of the black box machine learning model. So we are going to run the model first and then apply this explainability method. So it leads to uh, easier benchmarking and comparisons of model interpretability. So because it is model agnostic, it is not dependent on the model. We can uh, have a uniform way to benchmark and compare interpretability. So these methods, of course, have to be post hoc. Explanations are derived from a model after it has been trained, unlike the previous ways of explaining, which are anti hoc. Uh, this also helps uh, in this also, the model agnostic methods can also help if the features are not human interpretable. So, in the previous example of credit application, the credit score, um, the income, all those were human interpretable. But in many machine learning applications, the features like in this case, the image pixels are not human interpretable. So typically the features are the pixel values and they are not human interpretable. One million pixels, you cannot understand, right? One million numbers or 10 million numbers. These days, if you take a picture on iPhone, it creates uh, several megabytes of uh, pixel values. So you obviously cannot interpret humanly. Similarly, ChatGPT converts, uh, in fact, all these large language models convert uh, text into uh, um, funny numbers like this one. Um, so they work with numbers like this. And obviously these are not interpretable either. Um, so, so what do we do in such cases? Uh, <clears throat> so we still need explanations which can be understood by the human beings. Uh, so, <clears throat> so we need to convert uh, the cryptic uh, features Z using some, some algorithm, some method into human interpretable features. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in case of pictures, it could be uh, the, uh, the eyes or the mouth of a person or the ears of a person. So those are the human interpretable features. So we need to be able to convert non-human interpretable features like pixels into human interpretable features. Um, and then vice versa should also be there because uh, we want, uh, that's one of the requirement of uh, uh, explainability. I mean, the, uh, the explanation should be uh, friendly with machines and also the human beings. So we need this kind of a conversion mechanism. So Z is the uh, <clears throat> original features which are not human interpretable and Z dash are the human interpretable features. So the first algorithm that we are going to talk about is called local interpretable model agnostic explanations line. This is a paper uh, 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 authored by Riberio, uh, Marco, Tulio, Samir Singh, and Carlos, um, the paper is titled, Why Should I Trust You? Explaining the Predictions of Any Classifier. It was published in the SIG KDD conference of the ACM in 2016. Um, so the idea is, uh, 
it provides uh, local explanations for individual pre predictions, not global. That means uh, we take just one row in the table, the, the training data set, and try to explain it. So we don't explain the entire model as such. So, the, so that is where the local uh, is coming into picture. And then it needs to be interpretable. That means human understandable. The, uh, the explanation should be human understandable. That's the reason interpretable is there. Then model agnostic, it works on any model. That means it's a post hoc method. So, and of course, explanations. So it uh, <clears throat> uses a surrogate interpretable model like the ones discussed earlier. So for instance, the chat GPT is a, is a cumbersome model which cannot be understood. So that is the reason why the, this uh, method uses a surrogate model. That means it works by approximating the model locally with an interpretable model. So what are some of the interpretable models? The ones that we just discussed, like um, linear regression or linear classifier, logistic regression, uh, k-nearest neighbors, uh, decision trees, those are all interpretable models. So it uses, uh, such surrogate, surrogate is basically an approximate, right? Or uh, a substitute, interpretable model, like the ones discussed earlier. Um, and of course uh, it is local. So the surrogate model is trained on the data in a local context. So it doesn't look at uh, the entire data set. It looks at a very specific portion of the data set. And that that context is typically around a specific data item. That's why it's called uh, local. So we go instance by instance, one row at a time. Yeah, it is interpretable because it is it, the explanations need to be human understandable, and uh, <clears throat> it outputs uh, feature importance scores for the prediction, just like before, just like the humans did. They are. The model uh, Lime basically tells you the importances of the features, where, where the feature, where, uh, the model focused on which features to come up with the decisions. So that is the general idea. So because we talked about local interpretability, I thought we'll also talk about global interpretability. Uh, so what is the difference? So the focus for local uh, interpretability is individual predictions whereas global interpretability explains the overall model behavior. The scope is specific instance for local interpretability and the entire model or data set for global interpretability. The methods used for local interpretability are Lime and SHAP, whereas global interpretability, the ones that we saw just before like decision trees, and then there are more like the rule-based models, which provide you with the global interpretability for the entire data set. The goal for local interpretability is uh, to understand why a model made a specific prediction of uh, for a data item, and global interpretability to is to understand the how the entire model works in in general across all the data. Um, so the applications for local interpretability are debugging, identifying biases, building trust. And global interpretability uh, is mainly for model design, feature engineering, risk assessment, and so on. So if, in, if we realize that the model is, uh, for instance, uh, focusing on uh, the wrong kind of features, then we go back and redesign the model or do a uh, feature engineering all over again, things like that. So that is the purpose of global interpretability. Whereas local interpretability, uh, it's uh, about uh, debugging spe for specific instances. And the use cases similarly are going to change. So the use case for local interpretability is for uh, loan officers, like the instance of credit denial that we talked about, or clinicians, uh, right? So, so that's the use case for them because clinicians need to focus on individual patients. They cannot generally uh, talk about uh, the model. So clinicians need to understand why a 
particular patient was recommended, uh, say, statins, right? Um, or uh, uh, some other medication. So, so, so they're more focused on individual uh, instances. Uh, whereas global interpretability is important for regulatory um, situations where trust and compliance are crucial. So, and also for scientific research. Um, and the level of detail, of course, will be, uh, for a local interpretability, the level of detail is um, uh, for specific predictions, whereas global interpretability, some level of detail is sacrificed for comprehensiveness. So, I mean, these are general distinctions, but some techniques like, uh, there are techniques like partial dependency plots, um, and others which can be used locally or globally. Uh, so, but I just wanted to give you this difference. Uh, but today's uh, session will be focused on local interpretability. So let us look at uh, how Lyme works. Um, so this is a, uh, this is the a data set, for instance, let us say about for credit application, denial or uh, approval. So the pluses indicate uh, one class and the circles indicate another class. So if you look at the decision boundary, it is quite complex. The model is complex. Uh, so, it's, uh, so it's very curved around the data points, right? Um, uh, so we we got a new data item, a new application, uh, which is represented by plus. There's this big plus, right? The red color plus. Uh, I mean, just because it's plus does not mean that it is, belongs to one class or the other. It is just a symbol, right? Uh, this uh, paper is uh, this uh, figure is from the original paper. So I just uh, thought it's a better idea to explain the original paper itself. And um, the points on the left and right for this line um, uh, are generated, right? Uh, so these pluses and these dots are actually generated. Uh, we'll see how to generate these points. So we generate the points around this test data item. So if a new data item comes, we try to generate points. So you can see that uh, the original points are smaller. Uh, they're all of uniform size, like this plus, this plus, this plus, or rather this plus, this plus, and these two dots. They're all of uniform size. But the sizes of these dots, which are generated, and these pluses which are generated, are of different size. The reason is because the size of the points indicate the distance to the test item. Let us call this as test item. We are going to test whether this uh, applicant's uh, credit will be approved. Um, so how are we going to generate? Uh, so uh, let us look at the algorithm itself. So first is uh, we select an instance for explanation. For in this case, it is basically this, uh, this plus point. Um, so we choose this uh, and then generate perturbations around the instance. So we perturb the uh, this particular uh, person's uh, features by modifying the this particular person's features um, uh, randomly or ra adding some random noise, right? So we perturb, we change the features of this. So for instance, if the credit score is. Uh, 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 817, then we change it to 921, right? Uh, or if the income is 30,000, we change it to 35,000. So we make such changes and generate these points. So we generate a diverse data set that simulates how the model might behave with slight variance in, uh, in the input. So that is a key idea here. And then we use the black box model to do the predictions and use these labels, the labels that are generated by the black box model as labels for this small training data set around the point that we are trying to explain. 
right so <clears throat> so uh, and uh, then uh, one other thing we are going to do is we weigh the perturbations using a kernel usually exponential that means not all points get the same weight we'll see how to do it mathematically but uh, intuitively uh, the intuition is that uh, uh, the prediction for this is not as important as the prediction for this point here. The big pluses are more important than the small pluses. Similarly, the, the big circles are more important than the small circles. Um, so, so we assign a higher weight to instances closer to the original input uh, and lower weight to those farther away. Then we are going to fit an interpretable model to the new data and generated labels. So we, for us, uh, the simple model, we are going to use this as a uh, training data uh, and use a simple interpretable model like linear regression or a decision tree on these points, on these perturbed points, uh, uh, using uh, the distance weights from the previous step. So this interpretable model, this line uh, approximates um, the behavior of the complex model in the vicinity for the original instance. So if you see the decision boundary in this instance, the true decision boundary drawn by the, um, uh, by the complex machine learning model is this, uh, this kind of, almost like a straight line. It's almost like a straight line around this point. So this model, this linear regression model uh, approximate or linear classifier model approximate the uh, that decision boundary only around this point, not elsewhere. So then the then once we get this model, we generate the feature importance, right? So uh, <clears throat> so we analyze the coefficients because it's a linear model. We analyze the coefficient. Or for that matter, if you are using a tree-based decision tree kind of model, you are going to analyze the feature importances generated by the decision tree. Then we need a human readable format. So we visualize the explanation. So either we use a bar chart or a pie chart showing the contribution of each feature to the prediction. So to weigh the points uh, around this test point, um, the paper, what it does is it uses an exponential kernel. If you are familiar with uh, the normal distribution or support vector machines algorithm, there's something called uh, an exponential kernel. So the intuition is, so it is given by this formula. The intuition is that if this is the, this red dot is the point, the importance of the points uh, decreases exponentially with the distance. So this x minus x dash is the distance uh, from the point x. So the distance uh, exponentially decreases uh, with, uh, I mean, the influence of the point decreases exponentially. So, uh, so that is the idea that the paper uses. So to weigh the, uh, these points around uh, the test point, there is an exponential kernel that is applied. So this is an illustration um, of the same effect. So as we go farther away from the centroid of the cluster, the confidence of, uh, uh, or the importance of the point, data point, decreases smoothly and exponentially. Uh, the value, uh, this is uh, for the, uh, I mean, in support vector machines, this is called an RBF kernel but it is essentially an exponential kernel. So the value of uh, the kernel is maximum at the center where the distance is zero because e power zero is one. So now let us look, let, uh, take a peek into the math. It's not too difficult. Um, so the loss is locally weighed. The loss function is given by this L. Uh, there's a local weighting by this pi. So we'll see what each of these symbols mean. So F is the black box model, like the chat GPT or uh, the complex model, which is hard to understand. 
G is a surrogate interpretable model, uh, such as the linear regression or uh, logistic regression, decision tree, and things like that. Uh, so F Z F of Z is basically the prediction of the black box model. G of uh, Z dash. Remember, uh, we want interpretable features. So when we apply the uh, interpretable model, the simple model, we are going to use understandable features, not the original features. It could be possible if it, the data is tabular like credit application, then Z may be equal to Z dash. But uh, in general, um, we want to uh, make the prediction uh, using the interpretable features uh, when we are using the surrogate model. Uh, so that is the idea of F and G. And then this pi Z, pi X Z is the um, local weight for the points uh, around X. So the remember we generate uh, points around X. X is the point that we are, we are uh, uh, specifically considering. So uh, this is uh, given by the exponential kernel, like we talked earlier. The effect is that uh, the influence of the point decreases uh, exponentially with distance. Uh, so the importance that we give to farther points is exponentially decreasing. So this is, uh, so Z is basically the vector. This, uh, this R power D basically means it's a vector. That means there are D number of real numbers. Uh, is a sample in the perturbed set Z. So that is pi X. Uh, we already talked about uh, FZ. Z dash is the interpretable version. We already talked about it. And then the explanation is given by the, uh, is produced by minimizing the loss function so we are going to look at all the interpretable models. So capital G is the list of interpretable models like decision trees, inter, uh, logistic regression, and so on. For each interpretable model, we are going to minimize the loss. Uh, this loss is the same as this one, but there is an additional term called omega. So, uh, so what is omega? Uh, omega is the regularization um, I think it's given in the next slide. Okay. Uh, omega is the regularization uh, parameter, right? So if you know uh, L1 regularization or Lasso regularization, um, you must be knowing this regularization parameter. The, the effect of uh, adding this uh, is that some of the weights for some of the uh, less relevant features will become zeros. So what is the advantage of this? The advantage is that if there are say 100 features, if there are 100 columns in the tabular uh, in the table, it is very difficult to wrap our head around with 100 different weights, right? Uh, with just with one or two weights, it's much more easier to understand. For instance, if we say that the credit application is denied for be, because of the credit score, then it is easy to understand. If you say that it was denied because of 10% uh, 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 income, 20% credit score, 30%, and so on and so forth for 100 features, then it is very difficult to wrap our head around. So that is the reason why we add this, reg this term called regularization term. The omega G is the regularization term. So in case of regression, it is typically uh, lasso or L1 regularization. Um, in case of de uh, decision trees, this could be the depth of the tree. So we try to keep the trees, trees uh, we do not grow the tree too much. We are going to prune it off uh, at some level. So the idea is to re reduce the number of interpretable features. So that is the only idea. So you minimizing this loss function along with the regularization parameter, uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, in so folks who are familiar with statistics uh, might recognize the the term shrink shrinkage, right? So, the omega g is basically the shrinkage parameter in statistics. Uh, so, so use minimizing the loss, we get the explanations. So, 
the shy the g is the discrete letter uh, is the explanation generated so <clears throat> so that is the idea and uh, so g we already talked is a set of interpretable models omega is a regularization uh, parameter so using this algorithm uh, generating uh, local interpretable model, surrogate model, and all that stuff. Now, once uh, we generate this kind of a model, this kind of straight line model, it is very easy to interpret because the coefficients of this, uh, this the equation for the straight line are the importance for the features. So it is quite easy to um, uh, come up with this visualization. So this paper that I talked in the very in, in the beginning of the session, uh, we observed that uh, so the left hand side is a specific instance. So this person is uh, aged forty. You can see the age here, forty years, and this person does seek help for uh, for his mental problems, um, and. Um, uh, he does not, uh, he, say, he or she says that uh, uh, the mental issues do not interfere uh, sometimes, do not interfere often, and so on and so forth. So these are all collected in a, in a form, survey form, right? Um, so this is the person that we are trying to, uh, that plus, the big red plus is this person, right? Um, so... Now, uh, so interestingly, this person ha takes help, right? It says that, uh, where is that? Yeah, here, uh, where was that? Seeks help is yes. So this person is seeking help for mental issues, um, but the model predicts with high probability, 95% probability, based on the fact uh, uh, that uh, uh, it, the, there's no interference to the work. Uh, it predicts that uh, the person does not have mental issues. It predicts a zero, right? And the importance given, uh, the importances of the features, these are all the features, uh, basically the uh, answers given uh, in a survey form. So these are all the features. And if you look at the features, importance to the features, you will see that uh, uh, interference with uh, for uh, in work interference in the work sometimes is given the most importance even more importance than the um, uh, uh, importance than the interference quite often right um, so you can see the non-intuitiveness of the model, right? Uh, we, are, we achieved a great accuracy, but the model is uh, focusing on wrong variables, long, wrong features, and then making a wrong prediction in this specific instance. I mean, mental health is a very serious issue, right? Uh, so this is the plot produced by line. It gives you the feature importances of uh, individual features. Uh, one color indicates um, the importance uh, towards one class. The other color indicates the importance towards the other class. And it gives the, uh, uh, the numbers also uh, measuring the importance. So we can see that uh, if, some, if the mental issues do not interfere with work, it is given the highest importance, even if the person says that he is seeking help. So that is the fallacy here uh, that we observed with the machine learning models. So that's the reason why uh, in the conclusion we mentioned what I stated earlier. So we are also using uh, Lime for uh, explaining object detection. As you can see, the pixel values are not interpretable, but Lime does a good job in interpreting uh, the human readable feature. I mean, uh, converting the non-interpretable features to interpretable features. For instance, it can show positive regions in recognizing this as a bird and the negative regions in um, playing a role. So this work is still under uh, progress, is under review actually. So I cannot talk a lo whole lot about this. Um, uh, and then, so there is another technique called Shapley additive explanation, but I think, I don't know if I have time. So do I have time to cover this or shall we conclude quickly?
we shall conclude. Okay, so we'll conclude. Okay, so in that case, uh, I'll skip these slides and um, then talk about the future directions. So one future direction I feel is important is to um, uh, come up with explainable reinforcement learning. Right, reinforcement learning is used in more complex real-time environments like robotics and autonomous systems. Right, so uh, it's important that we come up with explanations for reinforcement learning, and we need more uh, intuitive, visual, and interactive explanations. So interactive uh, interfaces can enhance the explainability. So uh, as you can see. The explanations were visual, but not as interactive. So that is one area. And then some kind of reinforcement learning with human feedback for uh, explainability to improve the explanation. So uh, there's an explanation generated. There should be some feedback from the humans to explain, uh, to, to improve the explainable explanations. So that is another uh, re probably research area. Then, Aligning explainability practices with compliance standards. We saw GDPR has a, a substantial focus on explainability. So we want to integrate explainability more into the compliance standards. Uh, and then uh, the explanation should be able to change in real time. So you're driving a car and the self-driving car, sorry, you're going in a self-driving car and it took some decisions. Uh, we want explanations for those decisions in real time, right? So based on the context in which the decision is made. So that is another area of research. Then, uh, <clears throat> then there's, a, there's plenty of scope for combining ideas from fields like cognitive science, ethics, and human-computer interaction to enhance the in explainability methods. And... Uh, explanations that are tailored to the user's expertise and needs. Uh, we want the explanations to be very specific to the uh, user's needs. So these are some of the research questions and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Vishnu. This was a very um, impactful lecture and um, the importance of explainability cannot be underestimated in the current times, in the current climate. Does anybody have any question for Dr. Vishnu? So Dr. Vishnu, you uh, mentioned ChatGPT and you um, elaborated on the amount of neurons, um, the amount of connections that were used in the first ChatGPT going to 125 billion. Um, in that kind of situation, how um, important or possible is explainable AI in deep learning models? You know, because in the current chat GPT, for instance, we have some um, large language models with trillions of tokens. You know, the neurons are everywhere. So how can we use um, what current state-of-the-art techniques are available out there? for explainability for these large language models? So for deep learning models, yeah. have... sorry, uh, was there a question? Okay, so for the deep learning models, uh, there, are, uh, um, there are other techniques as well, not just the ones, I mean, you can still use these techniques. These are post hoc. Uh, so these can be, and model agnostic. So you can use the techniques uh, like SHAP and LIME um, uh, on those models as well. But there are some specialized techniques uh, um, uh, like uh, there's a technique called uh, LRP. I don't exactly remember now, but uh, so there's a technique called LRP. Um, uh, so which can be used specifically for uh, um, uh, for deep learning uh, models. And then this topic, uh, there's another concept called mechanistic interpretability, which is coming up uh, really well. 
uh, there's a lot of interest in that area as well, uh, which can be uh, used on large uh, neural networks. So it's an active area of research, um, uh, so which is uh, still under investigation. Uh, so, but uh, until that time, we have uh, less tools, uh, post hoc explanations like we used. Uh, so for instance, in a recent paper, uh, we, uh, in a recent paper uh, we, that we published explaining misinformation detection using large language models, we, uh, we explain the, uh, the large language model uh, classification using line, right? So you can see the, uh, these are all words. The words internally are uh, converted into vectors, the vector embeddings. But you can see that uh, they are converted back into words. Uh, the features are converted uh, uh, back into words. We can see what words are playing a role in the positive or negative prediction made by the large language models. So, so the technique that we talk line uh, can be used. So line and sharp can be used with large language models also. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Vishnu. Um, someone in the um, one of the attendees said they want to see your sharply, um, sharp, sharply or sharply um, slide. Your slide on sharply. Yeah, so I can go over, but uh, so I don't know if you have time for that. But yeah, what I had was uh, so this is also a model agnostic. Uh, uh, um, model agnostic method. It, it was authored by Scott and uh, others in 2017. Uh, so it's based on cooperative game theory, uh, specifically using Shapley values. So Shapley values treats uh, um, each feature as a player in a game. So it can be used for explanations at both global and local levels. And uh, Model prediction is the sum of the sharp values for each feature and calculates the average contribution of each feature to the prediction by considering all possible subsets of feature. So this uh, is coming from Lloyd Shapley's Shapley values. So some of you may be knowing that Lloyd Shapley won a Nobel Prize uh, for this his game theory, his inventions in game theory. He was a professor in University of California in Los Angeles, I believe. So the, the paper was published in 1953 and the goal was to distribute total gains among players in a correlation based on their contributions. So, so the idea is that each player gets their fair share of the total gains based on their marginal contributions. So for instance, uh, uh, player A's contribution may be a result of teamwork with player B, right? So that is the reason why we need to consider uh, subsets of players, correlations of players. So considers all possible correlations of players and their interactions. So order independent uh, proportional way uh, fairness is key here. Um, <clears throat> So we come up with this feature uh, subsets like this. Uh, uh, so for instance, for credit application, if these are the features on the top, then we come up with uh, subsets of all these features. And we basically apply this formula to come up with the uh, feature importance. So for each feature, uh, subset of the features, S, yes, we are going to compute this. Uh, so phi i is the feature attribution for feature i. X is a specific data item. F is the set of four features. S is the, the feature subset under consideration. F is the black box model. And uh, uh, this uh, the F of the subset with the feature i of X with the feature i minus the prediction with without the feature i is the contribution of the feature i in the subset s. That is quite intuitive, right? 
we remove the feature uh, uh, compute prediction we include the features computer prediction the difference will give the contribution of the feature so that is the idea and we do this for all subsets uh, we also give contribution by the by this combinatorial it's the inverse of the combinatorial if you look at this uh, this is the inverse of the combinatorial of choosing s number of uh, features from a total number of features f so so that's the weighting factor and uh, don't really it's hard to remove features in uh, uh, once the model is constructed right so what we do is instead of removing the features uh, we uh, random uh, we insert a random number in the in that particular feature if it is randomized then it makes no sense so that's how uh, we compute feature importances in sharp but the idea is basically uh, computing the feature importances using a different kind of method using the sharply values so you can, we, we generate for the paper that i talked earlier that we published we generated this kind of sharply uh, uh, visualization sharply value visualization okay Thank that you. is the uh, idea uh, dr celestin has a question yeah um dr vishnu <clears throat> Thank you. In this in this same figure, good, you brought it out. I wanted to ask a question. Very, very nice that you were able to pick a, a psycho intelligence that we are working on, you know. And you mentioned in this same research, you said that you people predicted mental issues to be zero. Because in psycho intelligence, you know, there is a level of madness in everyone. That's one of our analyses. There's this level of madness in everyone. So I don't know how you got the madness, mental issues to be zero. Because the research we are, work, we are working on, we are believing that that degree of madness can be cured, you know, depending on uh, explainable issues, you know, as we go on. So I, I was a little bit uh, brought back from that uh, analysis that you made. So you're saying that every person uh, has a degree of madness. Every person has a degree of madness. So that is what we are working on. But it depends on what at what level does it become a problem. Yeah. Because when you say it's zero, what are the what are the features that made you people say it's zero? You know, you know, people can have breakdown, they can have suicide thoughts, they can have mental breakdown. And that is what we are trying to do. So, you know, when you, it's like checking blood pressure and then suddenly, you know, your blood pressure is coming down, you know, and then you start all your blood sugar is coming down. You try to like take a chocolate or something to improve it, you know. Uh, so when you know that you are being tense, how do you come down you know, to make sure that you don't go overboard? Yeah, that is um, that is deep into psychology, I think. But intuitively, right? If you if you know that a person is uh, uh, taking help for mental issues, and then uh, um, uh, just because the uh, it's not interfering with his work, uh, classifying a, the person as not having mental issue is quite uh, worrisome, I think. But more importantly, see the. Um, the fact that the issue is not interfering with work sometimes is ranking more than the that it interferes often is also not intuitive, right? So if it is uh, uh, interfering often, then that is what should weigh more than sometimes. Mm -hmm. But the model is doing the other way around. Mm -hmm. So that is an inconsistency. But that's a good point that you bring up. Yeah, seeking help alone... Uh, um, is not the only yeah. deciding factor. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vishnu. Um, so now I want to call on the head of School of Creative Technologies and Arts, um, Sam Johnson, to give the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Sam. 
Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Penjel. Uh, that was a fantastically uh, informative and useful talk. I'm sure our students and colleagues that are attending this evening and our external guests found that incredibly useful. Um, it's wonderful to see this as the first of our series of November to remember. Um, we have two weeks of, of fantastic talks, but what a great inaugural discussion we've had there. So thank you very much for joining us again, Dr. Pendiala, and thank you to the organizers and also to all of our students and guests this evening. So I think it just behoves me then to say, Thank you very much. Um, Larry, can, are you able to bring um, Dr. Pendiola's award upon the screen? Is that possible? Yes, yes, I see. Absolutely fantastic. So thank you, Dr. Pendiala, for joining us again, for sharing your expertise, uh, for giving us so many useful insights into this incredibly important field um, and really underlying the, the amount of work that needs to be done regarding the reliability of different models in a whole range of different sectors, actually. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the future, of course, uh, both in terms of developing research, but also we do hope you'll join us again to speak to our colleagues and students. So perhaps everyone could give a round of applause to Dr. Pendiala and a big thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity and I look forward to working with you again. Lovely. Thank you, colleagues. And we'll see you tomorrow for another fantastic lecture. Yes. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Vishnu. Yeah, thank you so much for the yeah, opportunity. We'll, we'll see you on, uh, uh, that is next week. Yeah, the 14th, right? Oh, 14th, yes, 14th. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.